lead for us to start our service this morning. Thank you, Jean, that was beautiful. Good morning, friends. My name is Sarah Brewer, and I'm pleased to be joining you for worship this morning. I'm a United Church minister who's recently moved back to Ontario after almost 20 years of ministry studies and service on the prairies. My main reason for moving here is family. Gord and Muriel Kerr are my mother and father-in-law. And you might also know my father, Bob Brewer, who is the musical director at St. John's United in Elmville. My spouse has a new congregation here. And while I search for my own, I'm enjoying the opportunity to join folks like yourselves so that your ministers can refresh their spirits after a challenging year. Although I know that Jennifer is at the church this morning helping to make sure the technology works well. So we thank her for doing that. On that note, we're going to take a moment to breathe and to get comfortable as we settle into this time of worship to refresh our own spirits. If you have a candle with you where you are, I invite you to take a moment now and light it. As we do this, we remember Jesus who said, I am the light of the world. 
May the light of his life continue to inspire ours today. Would you join me in our call to worship? Come, beloved people of God, we bring our doubts and our questions. Come, beloved people of God, we bring our fears and our worries. Come, beloved people of God, we bring our sense of wonder and mystery. Come, beloved people of God, we remember that God's peace is deep enough to welcome us all. Let us pray. Holy One, in this Easter season, we come to you singing alleluias, celebrating new life all around us, not quite believing at all, but going along with it just the same. We celebrate the doubters and the questioners among us who simply keep our faith real, who demand that we live our believing into faith that works towards justice and peace and making sure that the hungry are nourished and loved. We celebrate the saints among us, whose courageous faith flies without a safety net, reminding us that true discipleship is risky and radical in the face of a world held hostage by greed, love of power, and denial. We are your Easter people, Holy One, doubters, saints, sinners, questioners, spiritual and religious, people who skip, run, and stumble on the journey. We pray that wherever we are in our own journeys today, you might open our ears and eyes to your call to be your love, wherever we are. In the name of Christ and in your love, we ask it. Amen. Our opening hymn for this morning is from Voices United Hymn Book, number 399. We're going to be singing verses one and five of God whose love is ever with us. for you this morning. Do you ever wonder about things? What kind of things do you wonder about? When I was a child, I once received a magic eight ball for Christmas. I used to ask it all kinds of questions. Like, am I going to get a good grade on my test? 
And then I'd shake it up and I'd flip it over and it would say something really profound like, wait and see. Sometimes we make jokes about things we don't understand, like which came first, the chicken or the egg? But not all the things we wonder about are funny. Sometimes we wonder about important things too, like why bad things happen to good people or what we can do to end this pandemic. Sometimes too, we wonder about our faith. Unfortunately, the church through the years hasn't been all that good at embracing our questions. If, for example, you ever wondered in Sunday school how the animals could have been on the ark together for 40 days without killing each other or eating each other, the teacher might have told you that that's just the way it is and to stop asking questions. You can't blame church people for thinking that way. Once a long time ago, just after Jesus died, a man named Thomas had some questions too. And the church responded to his questions by giving him the nickname of Doubting Thomas. You might have even heard that nickname still used today sometimes to describe other people who find something hard to believe without proof. But you know what I think? Based on the stories of Jesus that we hear in the Bible, I expect that if he were to log in here today with us, he'd probably welcome whatever questions we threw at him. Now, I'm not saying we'd like his answers. He might tell us that if we truly want to live God's way, we should go sell everything we have and give the money to the poor. But I do believe that he'd welcome our questions. Can you think of some ways that the world has made, been made better because people asked questions? Can you think of a question that you'd want to ask Jesus if you had the chance? I wish we were all together so that we could hear each other's questions. One day, for now, in this day, it's time for us to listen to our Bible story for this morning and find out what question it was that Thomas asked. But first, we're going to sing together from Voices United Hymn Book, number 299, Teach Me God to Wonder. Our Bible story this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It's combining some of John 14 with some of John 20. 
And it's from the lectionary story Bible written by Ralph Milton. It's a version of the story about Thomas that uh, is quite well told. It goes like this. Don't ask so many questions, Thomas. That's what Thomas's teachers said in school. That's what Thomas's parents said at home. That's what Thomas's friend said. But Thomas couldn't help it. When the rabbi, the teacher, told them things in school, Thomas often asked, how do you know? Sometimes that made the rabbi angry. I know just because I know, Thomas. It's true because I say so. Thomas had to be quiet, but he didn't like the teacher's answer. Thomas was sad when his questions made people angry, but he couldn't stop asking. When Thomas grew older, he became one of Jesus' special friends. He became a disciple. Thomas liked Jesus because Jesus never told him to stop asking questions. One day, Jesus was trying to explain what was going to happen. I am going away, said Jesus. I'm going to get a place ready for you. God's house has room for you and for everyone else. You know the way to God's house. No, we don't, said Thomas. What is the way? That's a good question, Thomas, said Jesus. I am the way. If you really love me and love each other, then you know the way. I still don't understand all of it, said Thomas. That's okay, said Jesus. Just keep asking questions. Not long after Jesus, not long after that, Jesus died. He was killed by people who didn't like the way he said that God loved everyone. Thomas was very sad when Jesus was killed. So when some of the other disciples said Jesus was alive again, Thomas really wanted to believe them, but he couldn't. His mind kept asking questions. How can somebody be dead and then be alive again? When some of the disciples told Thomas they had seen Jesus, Thomas asked, how can you be sure it was Jesus? How do you know it wasn't somebody else? We saw him with our own eyes, said the other disciples. Maybe, said Thomas, but I have to see for myself. I have to see the place in Jesus' hands where they put the nails. Otherwise, I can't believe it. A few days later, Thomas and his friends were together. All the doors were closed. But suddenly, there was Jesus in the room with them. He smiled at Thomas. Come here, my friend. Touch the places where they put the nails. It really is me. Thomas began to cry. He was so happy to see Jesus. Oh, yes, it is you, Jesus. I'm so glad. Now I know that you are alive again. I won't ask any more questions. Oh, don't stop asking questions, Thomas, Jesus said. I am glad you are able to see me so you can be sure. Then you can believe. But there will be lots of people who won't be able to see me. They will ask questions too. It will be hard for them to believe just as it was hard for you to believe. I will need you to help them with my story. You mean you're not angry because I didn't believe right away that you were alive again, Thomas asked. No, not angry at all, said Jesus. I like it when people ask hard questions. But you won't understand everything, Thomas. You will never find answers to all your questions. Just remember that I love you and that God loves you. Nobody can prove that part, but it's the part that is most true. May we hear wisdom for our lives from this story in our faith tradition. Let us pray. Loving and beloved God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Nadia Boltz Weber, a Lutheran pastor 
and author from the United States, says that book promotion is not all it's cracked up to be. As she describes it, I'm basically boring myself to death out there. I mean, I'm saying the same things over and over, which is downright monotonous to me. She goes on to explain, therefore, that she advocates as much as possible for question and answer sessions with the audience, which led to an interesting insight in one context. Normally, before COVID, in a question and answer session, someone would walk up to the microphone and ask a question such as, I'm curious about the symbolism of your tattoos. But at one promotional event in Grand Forks, North Dakota, about 1,100 people showed up and they realized that the regular question and answer process wasn't going to work. So the event organizers asked people with questions to write them down and hand them in instead. When they did that, Nadia realized how different it is to write something anonymously than it is to stand up and say it out loud in a room full of people. The adapted process change the nature of the questions, from questions about her as an author to questions about the faith of the people writing them. As she sums it up, I was struck by the sheer number of questions that were so similar, like, is it okay to feel distant from your faith when you're going through a really hard time? What does it even mean to have faith? What if I'm not sure what I believe? Is doubt okay? And one person didn't even write a question, but a statement. Sometimes I wonder if there really is a God because of all the hurt and suffering in life. These questions and the statement that people asked of Nadia are indicative of the fact that we frequently equate faith with not doubting. We assume that having faith means not wondering about things like whether God has a big toe. We imagine that faith means being totally trusting and peaceful and serene, even when really tough stuff is happening to us and around us. Tough stuff was happening around Thomas. His friend Jesus had recently been executed by the state hung up on a cross between a couple of thieves and left there to die. Yet not only were he and his friends grieving that loss, they were scared. Most of the disciples had been there in the garden with Jesus when the soldiers had come to arrest him. And for all they knew, the soldiers could be coming after them next. Not surprisingly, then, most of the disciples were keeping a low profile in the days after the first Easter, hiding out together in a room with locked doors. That's where they were in the evening after the discovery of the empty tomb, when the risen Christ came among them, showed, him, showed them his hands and feet, spoke words of peace and breathed upon them. Well, most of them anyways. The Bible doesn't tell us where Thomas was, only that he wasn't with the others. I've heard it suggested that's because Thomas was the courageous one who had the guts to go out and find food for himself and his friends. I don't know. Wherever he was, it clearly wasn't with the others when the risen Christ first appeared among them. And when they tried to fill him in on what they had seen, Thomas replied that he couldn't believe it until he too saw it for himself. For that, we've labeled him Doubting Thomas. And Thomas isn't the only one. His nickname is extended beyond the church into society at large. In the same way we refer to a person who does a good deed as a good Samaritan, we refer to a person who is skeptical as a Doubting Thomas especially in church circles. Many people would label the folks who asked anonymous questions of Nadia about faith and doubt as doubting Thomases. 
I expect that's why they could only ask those very real questions when they were able to do so anonymously. All too often, I think the church would rather have people say the right words than the honest ones. Yet the fact of the matter is this. When Christ returned a second time and encountered Thomas, he didn't label him. Jesus didn't judge him. He came to Thomas just as he was and offered him peace. It's us, the people in the church, who've been the ones pointing our fingers. And you know what they say about pointing fingers? We have to be careful because for every finger we point, there's three more pointing back at us. Isn't this the truth for many of us when it comes to faith? We have lots of questions and doubts too. When I was in Alberta a few years ago, I had lunch with a friend of mine in the mountains. One of the things she wanted to tell me was that she'd started going to church, which she followed up promptly with a comment about being a cynic. When I asked her why she said that, she started to tell me about all the things that didn't make sense to her or that she found hard to believe. What struck me about her questions and doubts, however, was not a lack of faith, but their testament to faith. Here was someone who was actively listening to the Bible stories in church, then pondering them in search of their meaning for her own life. I feel the same way about Thomas's reaction in our Bible story for today. When Thomas's friends fill him in on this incredible experience that he has missed, Thomas doesn't refuse to believe it. Thomas has faith enough to believe that if it happened once, it could happen again. He says that when he too can see his resurrected friend, he'll know they are right. An interesting thing in this story for me is that we tend to overlook the fact that the other disciples also didn't believe until they had seen the holes in Jesus' hands either. I wonder why we don't, I wonder why do we hold them up as models of faith while shunning Thomas? What purpose does that serve? What impact does that have on us and others? When people ask Jesus how to live in God's way, he never says that they have to learn all the right answers. Jesus says that they must learn how to love. And Jesus certainly didn't say that we should believe everything we are told. Remember, he regularly challenged the status quo. As the theologian Marcus Borg put it in a Bible study series called Living the Questions, when you think about it, Faith as belief is relatively ineffective. You can believe all the right things and still be a jerk. To soften that, you can believe all the right things and still be miserable, or still be in bondage, still be untransformed. So the emphasis upon belief is, I think, modern and mistaken. That's the thing. Jesus asked people to stop being so judgmental. Jesus invited people to be transformed. And often to be transformed, we have to be willing to ask questions, to raise doubts, to challenge the way things are. So I know that there are thousands of preachers around the world this Easter season who are telling their congregations not to be like Thomas but I'm going to invite you instead to do the opposite. Personally, I think we should all try to be a little bit more like him, willing to be courageous and honest about belief and doubt and willing to live with integrity in our faith. May it be so. Amen. Our next hymn that we're going to sing in response to the story and my reflection is 
from Voices United, number 185. And we're going to sing more voice, more verses than you normally do because it tells the story of Thomas with a bit of a theological reflection interwoven. This is, you tell me that the Lord is risen. This morning's Minute for Mission is titled, Being at Camp Solidified My Strong Connection with the Natural World. None of us can go a single day without having an impact on someone's life. And we can't always predict how what we do to help change a life might wind up changing ours as well. Take Bill Darnell. Bill's love affair with nature began at camp, but it didn't end there. Far from it. Bill's childhood experience of camp wound up inspiring one of the world's most influential environment, environmental movements. Camping had a big effect on me. I grew up in suburbia and didn't have much access to the natural world. Camping was an opportunity to go out and be in nature. It was amazing. Being at camp solidified my strong connections with the natural world, he says. Bill's early camp experience instilled such a love of nature that when he became an adult, he became an environmental activist. When I was 25 years old, not far removed from my camp years, I saw that there were they were testing nuclear weapons. That was so obviously wrong that I felt I had to do something to stop it, he says. 
So Bill and a small group of friends anxiously climbed on board an 85 foot fishing boat, later dubbed Greenpeace. Together they set sail for Alaska to stop the testing of a nuclear bomb. Greenpeace as a movement was born. Bill's story proves that camping experiences in childhood can lead to a lifelong commitment to care for God's creation. As scientists and activists sound the alarm around climate change, and experts report that not spending enough time outside is having an impact on our children's health and well-being, outdoor ministry has never been more crucial. It's just one of the many reasons why mission and service really matters. Your mission and service gifts support over two dozen United Church run camps across the country. Every year, your generosity gives thousands of children an opportunity to go to camp. There they learn life skills, meet other campers, explore faith and spend time outside. Like Bill, some young people may leave camp so impressed by the natural environment that they get on board a movement to take care of it. Camping made an incredible difference in my life. I know it will make an incredible difference to young people across Canada. I give thanks to those who support it, he says. Please make a gift to Mission and Service. Your support not only makes a difference right now, but also has an impact on the future for all of us who are blessed to live in the beautiful world God created. In these days, we know that we can't pass an offering plate like we do when we gather in person. So we bring our gifts, we send them to the church, we drop them off in the mailbox, we make them by par. In whatever ways we give, let us offer our prayer together. Living God, today we remember how Jesus appeared to his disciples in their hour of fear and offered them your peace to still their hearts. May the gifts we offer now help us to bring peace in the places where it is needed most. Bless us and our gifts, we pray. Amen. And we continue to bring our prayers together and lift them up to God. God, you share with us the joys and struggles of each day. Remind us again that you are here beside us. Teach us to see your face in every person, both those near to us and those who we will never meet. Guide us to cherish the ordinary moments of each day as glimpses of the sacred. Help us to trust that your presence with us will give us the strength we need to meet the challenges of every day and help us to keep our focus on today's challenges rather than worries about tomorrow. Help us also to share that strength with others as wounded healers who travel the road together. We pray especially this day for struggling healthcare workers trying to keep people alive and themselves whole in the midst of this third wave of the pandemic for public health and political decision makers, whether we agree with them or not, who have had to make tough decisions. For teachers, parents, students and school administrators as they return to online learning this week. For everyone who is missing loved ones right now, be they friends or family. For those who do not have a safe place to call home in the midst of this pandemic. For the earth itself as Earth Day approaches. And for the cares that we carry with us in our own hearts this day. The people who we name to you now in this moment of silence. Help us to be witnesses to the good news of Easter, wherever our life paths may take us this week. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, who invited us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is from Voices United as well. We're going to be singing verses one and two of hymn number 187. Be with you, said Jesus to his disciples. He continued, as God has sent me, so I now send you. Friends, we are sent forth to live out our faith, knowing that not even our doubt or fear can lock God out of our lives. So let us go in peace to love and serve our God today and always. Amen.